It's a curious thing that if someone has a business or venture that turns out nice, they are condemned to wander the world like the ancient mariner trying to explain how it all happened. But I guess in the end, all I can do today is recount to you the grand adventure, the ripping yarn that the Mambo and Deus Ex Machina story is. And if there are conclusions to be drawn, then it, as, as it relates to your industry and p pursuits, then feel free to draw away. If I had to alert you to the central tenet of the Mambo and Deus Ex Machina story, it would be to say that it's a story of the conflict between creativity and passion on one hand, and the massive weight of the conventional wisdom and compromise of corporate thinking on the other. The business stories that I like are where people follow their hearts, their passions, and their intuitions, and money is almost an embarrassing product, byproduct of a labor of love. So to the story. One of the, my first business ventures uh, was Phantom Records, because the most important thing in the late 60s and 70s was music. And Sydney was full of pubs. Every pub was a live venue, almost. Everybody you, you knew was either in a band or was best friends with someone in a band. And, you know, m music was a fabric of the, the society that we lived in. And I started an independent record store where we imported music. We started releasing bands. And, uh, but it was, it was very... It was, uh, it was very artisanal, is all I can say. But it was incredibly good fun. And once again, in terms of my future career, it, it, it gave me ideas and put things in my head. So Mambo came along. It was a, it was a, it was a result of a bunch of different things that, that, that mattered to me. First of all, I had a business screen printing, and it was a very commercial business and horrible. There was three shifts a day, unions, the whole drama. Um, but this idea came up because I was, I was a surfer, I knew the surf industry, but I really, as an old lefty, I really disliked the way the surf industry had progressed. And um, so I decided to start this, uh, start a brand that would be a combination of art and music and all the things of, you know, attitude is what we would have. Uh, I was great friends with Reg Mombasa from Mental as Anything, and I'd, I was always forced to use this terrible art in our commercial side of the business. Like, like, what about Reg? And nobody sort of understood what that was. So I asked Reg if I could start to use some of the elements of his artwork. This was a, a single cover, and there were those fire-breathing chooks in the front, which I thought were terrific. And uh, so I, we turned those sort of things into product. And this was very important, that we, we were able to use the work of fine artists or people who had trained as fine artists. There were a lot of people around who you know, had studied art, had practiced art, and there was a quality there that was, was, was wonderful. And, and Reg, of course, was a great example of that. But in the end, we were able to collect a wonderful group of contributors to Mambo with all sorts of different styles, different attitudes, and different things. And it, it was what truly made it unique. We're like stand-up comedians of the rag trade. This was an example of a guy called Richard Allen drew this, and we thought it was really funny. It's like a punk who had decided to put a bone through his nose. People came out and said, that's racist. That, that looks like an African-American. And we said, well, no, it's not. It's just a punk. So we could very quickly answer that with a very white-looking guy with a spanner through his nose. And then... <laughs> And that was really funny, so that became a same guy with his finger through his nose. And, but it's very puerile and very silly, but it, does, it makes my point that, you know, a, a joke on Monday became a product by Friday. You know, it was that quick. We could do what we want. Everyone had this... There was a wonderful agreement about what we were doing, what the humour was. It, was. it was really was a three-wing circus. I was the ringmaster, but it was what people were contributing in wonderful ways. Um, one of the really important elements of my idea about marketing is polarization. I'm here to tell you, if you piss off half the people, the other half will love you. And you'll have wonderfully dedicated um, followers and a whole lot of angry people who can't work out why you're still surviving. Um, we, <laughs> we, in, in the annals of all the many ventures that we had, there was this wonderful thing that a bunch of right-wing Christians in Newcastle decided to build a bonfire and burn, burn Mambo apparel. And, I mean, you cannot get anything better than that. Like, it was just, 
you, you, um, we were so delighted. And in fact, the problem sort of became that in the end, people expected us to be kind of um, controversial and uh, confrontational. And it became harder and harder to do that because when there's an expectation, that's what you'll do. That's what, what people expect. When a venture capital company buys a, a business, you've got to get rid of the guys who had the first idea because they're nothing but trouble. So at, there's a point where you sort of become more of an impediment than an asset. And I had that feeling with Mambo. So some people wanted to buy it, so we sold it. Okay, then I had nothing to do and I had some ideas and I really wanted to, I love motorbikes, I like surfing, I wanted all these things to come together. So I came up with the idea of Deus Ex Machina. It's Latin for God is in the machine or God is from the machine, I guess is the correct um, translation. And I liked it because it was very pretentious and brainy, and, but it just gave a possibility of being a whole lot of different things. As we later would say, any god, any machine is fine with us. Um, the, the things that I'd grown up with were on any Sunday, which was a 60s movie about guys riding bikes. And the same guy who made that also made The Endless Summer, one of the great sort of early surf movies. And that we wanted that to be like at the heart of what we were doing. The motorcycle industry, this is put here because to me this looks incredibly daggy and uninteresting, but that's what the motorcycle industry had become. Um, I apologise if anybody thinks that looks pretty cool. Um, what we were looking at was in Japan there was this wonderful custom culture that just to us was referencing vintage ideas but doing it in a very contemporary manner. All the references were vintage, these old sort of 60s races and speedway and things when people, you know, people could fix their own motorbikes, where they built their things and had fun doing it. Then we, uh, we started to build bikes and ultimately we, we, we were building bikes all over the world in a certain style. We didn't, what we tried to do, and I think this is important to the whole idea, we didn't write a blue, give, create a blue book and give it to people and say, this is what you have to do. Like, do not vary out of this. We, we figured that we, what we had done was created a philosophical idea and the, the fun was to take this idea and plant it in different environments and see how it would go. Because in the end, every country in the world, there's people like dicking around with motorbikes and bicycles and doing all these sort of things. So, but they do it in different ways depending on where what the culture is that they come from. Um, we created this old Kabi Tuckwell created this beautiful diagram here to explain what was going on. We figured we needed good product. I had come from the from the Mambo years. Kabi, the creative director of Mambo, who I'll talk further about in a minute, um, was from a real advertising agency. Kabi drew the created the tail of the the Jetstar. Um, aeroplanes. You know, he was, he was a corner office serious guy. So we figured we could, we could do something. Um, first of all, we wanted this base culture, this, uh, this place where you could come and find things, learn things, where things could congregate and be interesting. Surfing and motorcycles were, motorcycles first of all, and then surfing. Um, the community of, was really critical to this. The, if you create this culture, you need a community to come and participate in it and, and in fact, speak to it and, and add to the idea as it goes along. Both Kabi and I have spent a lot of time uh, in, in Tokyo. We're very close to the Japanese. But, again, they are a very finely tuned consumer. When we first started, they didn't like what we were doing. There was no great uptake because they figured that the ideas that we were using, the, the references of the motorbikes, had come from Japan, and the Japanese really don't like being having something that sold to them that they figure they came up with in the first place. But when we opened in um, when we opened in Bali, and this whole idea of surfing and motorcycling coexisting, uh, then it sort of worked really well. So this is a place in Harajuku that Kabi designed, and uh, and it's it's worked very well, and it's gone great. This is a picture of Kabi and I, I put it here, looking awfully pleased with ourselves, because we are. We opened this, this is Japan, and uh, it, it, it was very satisfying that this place was humming. 
in one of the coolest sort of the districts in the world. And I just want to say, while I might have had the idea for Deus, I knew that it was never going to work unless I had somebody to come and contribute who was incredibly clever, because I figured I wasn't. And I knew Carby, his wife had worked for me in Mambo, and he had a, he had a serious job in a serious advertising agency, but I somehow convinced him to give all that security up and come and throw his lot in with what was a pretty vague idea at the time. <laughs>